Talk Live's live Sunday edition. Give us a call at 855-450-FREE. That's 855-453-7333. And this, Stephanie, Stephanie, uh, and Mark here with you. (laughs) Sorry, (laughs) sorry, Stephanie. That's okay. You know, this is uh, supposed to be our very first show on Extreme XM. Now, as I understand it, we were actually on last week. We got a call from Extreme XM. So this last is, week was pretty extreme. It, <laughs> and, you know, I was looking through the lineup of Extreme XM and it's it does seem to be pretty extreme. You know, some of in the radio business, sort of what's considered extreme at times is some guy, some, some usually overweight fella sitting in a, a studio talking about boobs. That's what oftentimes in radio is ex, extreme. Now, I don't see that happening here on uh, Extreme X, XM's lineup necessarily. But, you know, some, some guy called Bubba the Love, bu- Bubba the Bubba the Semen <laughs> Soaker, he's out there, he's talking about boobs and all this stuff. And that's what they call, uh, that's what they call extreme talk. Well, unlike them, we are in good shape and we only sometimes talk about boobs. Sometimes. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, to me... Me, extreme talk, it's, you know, that that's not extreme. Some, I mean, you can hear somebody talking about boobs anywhere. Oh, what yeah. You can't, it's commonplace. What you can't hear, what's, um, what is a truly extreme is, say, an intellectual property lawyer that wants to do away with all intellectual property law. And that's what we have today with Ke- Stefan Kinsella. Stefan? I'm here, Mark. Say something extreme for me. Well, I'm extremely fond of uh, fond of liberty and property rights. If that's uh, if that's extreme nowadays. So, is my intro accurate? You want to get rid of uh, intellectual property law? Yeah, and it's not as extreme as you might think. I mean, there are, I'm sure there are income tax attorneys out there who defend people from the uh, IRS who would prefer there to be no income tax. But so long as there is one, there need to be income tax lawyers. But uh, but yeah, yeah, I've been a patent lawyer for about 18 years, and I've come to the view that. The patent system and the copyright system should not be reformed. They should be completely uh, abolished. They're basically a um, an affront to liberty and property rights. So how do you make a living with holding that view? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's only a small part of my job now, and I try to uh, help my client uh, defend themselves from the patent system, which is unfortunately necessary, similar to how a um, a tax attorney helps their clients defend themselves from the uh, from the state and the and the IRS. Very cool. Now, uh, to try to explain to me um, what, well, first off, why you hold this view. Uh, yeah, let's let's start with that. Why do you hold this view? I mean, a lot of people would say things like, "Well, we've got to have patents. If we didn't have patents, people wouldn't invent. Nobody things. would invent anything, right?" Yeah, and I think in, in a way, it's a it's it's a sign of um, a, a kind of a respect for property rights because we've been told that patent and copyright. Uh, to mention only the two most um, prominent of the types of what's called intellectual property now, uh, the others being trade secret and trademark and other things. But we've been told that these are types of intellectual property. And of course, if we're capitalists and Westerners and Americans and even libertarians and we're in favor of property rights, then we have to be in favor of all types of property rights. Um, but if you go back and you reexamine this and you don't take your lessons from the state about what we libertarians and free market and liberty loving people, regard as individual freedom and property rights, then you will see that we've been sold um, you know, a bill of goods. Basically, uh, patent and copyright are nothing but protectionist, mercantilist-type measures that protect people from competition. They originated in state uh, grants of uh, monopoly, favoritism, and censorship, and they've been democratized and industrialized. And the, the, the label intellectual property was slapped on them about 100 years ago to help sell this idea to the people because they sort of had a suspicion about these monopolies the state was granting. Yeah, it's interesting, so, so, Stefan, how, how <laughs> I, I think if, if you say to most people, should certain companies have a monopoly privilege that's enforced by the government, they will say, well, no, of course not. That sounds like uh, communism or something. But when you think about intellectual property, so-called, that's really what it is. Yeah, and if you ask people, should, should companies be protected from competition or when you enter the market with a given product or service, should people be free to compete with you? They would say, well, they should be free to compete with you. Now, do, but, patents, how long do patents go, go on, Stefan? Um, I mean, so patent, I, patents last about – well, they last 20 years from the date you file them, but they don't come into force until they issue, and that takes about two or three years. So roughly 18, 17 years of, of term for each patent. And then once it's expired, it's, uh, it can't be renewed. So the person, who invented, the person who invented the paperclip is not getting residuals off that, right? <laughs> Correct, but what 
the, what you can do is uh, you can come up with improvements during the term of the patent and keep filing these incremental improvements, and they, you know, people find tricks to extend the life of it. And in the drug case, um, the the FDA sort of, you know, the, the, the standard libertarian defense is that the government persecutes big businesses, but in reality, the FDA, although it does impose big costs on the pharmaceutical industry, it really protects them from competition, and it basically gives them another monopoly on top of the patent monopoly. So. You know, when your patent expires, then they can go to the FDA and try to get the FDA to prevent um, generics from getting uh, a substitute drug right away. Because you know, so the FDA sort of adds on to the monopoly of the of the patent monopoly. So, how long do copyrights last? I mean, it's my understanding that like the Sonny Bono law is like life plus ninety nine or something crazy like that. Well, yeah. So, uh, what's interesting is originally patent and copyright both lasted about fourteen years, and if you study the history of this. The way they came up with this term, which is completely arbitrary, was oh, sure they said, is. well, let's say you have a guild-type system, and you have a, uh, an apprentice, and what's the term of, of an apprentice? It was apparently about seven, seven years. years. So they said, well, we need to give you protection from competition uh, for about two of your apprentice terms so that, to give you time to train them in your method before, before you start having competition arise. I mean, it's a totally nutty idea. Oh. Um, but gradually, that 14 years has been extended over time. Uh, to the point now where copyright lasts right now for about um, – uh, it, it depends on whether it's an individual authoring it or whether it's what's called a work for hire. Okay. If it's a work for hire and it's – actually the, the author is the corporation that employs the person. That is legally the author. I think it's like 120 years or something like that. Um, well, it's actually the longer of 95 years from the date of publication or 120 years from the date of creation, something like that. So roughly 120 years. I've heard the reason they don't – for... I've, Sorry, heard, I've heard the reason they don't sing happy birthday at restaurants is because <laughs> happy birthday is copyrighted by somebody, and therefore you cannot sing it at a, a – you know, sort of for a commercial purpose. Is this yeah, so? That, that's, my, that's my understanding as well. That's why you will see it. Sometimes in movies, you know, big movies where they can afford to, to pay off the uh, the heirs of the happy, happy birthday song originator, but sometimes you'll go to you know Bennigan's or something and they'll be singing this happy something happy else. birthday happy sort of happy like birthday a, right or something yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they'll, they'll they'll sing some knockoff of happy birthday because they can't, they don't want to pay to sing happy birthday and that makes perfectly good sense that they wouldn't want to pay. But it's amazing that this song that's so ubiquitous, sung by everybody, it's so much a part of our culture. Not that I think that this yeah. really matters matters with any song. As far as I'm concerned, they could uh, they could at, at Bennigan's they could sing Dreamweaver to you and it shouldn't matter. But exactly. uh, uh, the <laughs> you know the my Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean or Mozart's uh, Arias or something. I don't even know how, if I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, if they, if were, they were to sing those, that's completely okay. Like, for instance, the, the Baby Einstein videos that are out are put to classical music. I'll bet that's not because they believe classical music makes kids smarter. I'll bet it's because there's no copyright law on that. And this is an example that everybody can relate to, Mark, but, I mean, just think of some of the less obvious examples of how intellectual property law harms people. Stefan was mentioning earlier about drugs and how companies are really not free to improve upon existing drugs and make subtle tweaks to maybe the formulation or the chemical structure so that they have less side effects or that they're better or cheaper or whatever. And uh, sometimes even the process by which things are produced is patented, and so it really creates more expensive drugs for patients who need them. Stephen? Yeah, I, I, that's completely accurate. And uh, on the Baby Einstein thing, I believe that the uh, the songs they use are free from copyright, but I do believe that they had to pay the Einstein estate for the right to use the trademark. The for name. Einstein. Hold the line, yeah. Stephen. Free Talk Live, 855 450 free. Talk Live's live Sunday edition. It's Mark with you. And Stephanie. 855-450-FREE. Give us a call on the toll-free call-in line sponsored by SACL CAI. And, you know, with these current stressful times and sometimes those summer sniffles, you may become run down. Thank goodness there's a natural supplement with all the vitamins and minerals that we need that the human body can possibly absorb. Here's Mike Buck from New Zealand's Nature Bee. 
mark, it's true. Look, Nature Bee plant pollen from New Zealand is the perfect supplement. Over 150 micronutrients, all essential for your good health, completely 100% natural. You know what? The only thing in our capsules is pure plant pollen. No additives, preservatives, no chemicals, and it goes to work quickly. Within a few days, you'll be feeling a better energy level and we'll be guaranteeing you to improve that immune system. You know, the Nature Bee is kind of like getting a giant salad buffet in two golden capsules. Um, I, I love it. I've been taking it for 18 months consistently, and I or- reorder and reorder because it works for me. It makes me feel better, I sleep better, and I have better digestion. Now, you can have all, um, all the listeners can have uh, Nature Bee. How in the world can they order it, though, Mike? Yeah, see, that's easy. We've made this really, really easy. A huge six-month supply is just ninety nine ninety five plus delivery. And when you order or reorder right now, we give you three more months for free. When you do the math, that's 37 pennies a day to feel like a million bucks. And all that with our money-back guarantee. So what would you be waiting for? Get aboard the health parade right now. Call toll-free 1-866-834-8355. All the way to Auckland, New Zealand, 866 866- Eight three four eight three five five, or get with us online at Nature B E E. That's naturebee dot com. Call the toll free B line at eight six six eight three four eight three five five. The sooner you start taking Nature, nature B, the sooner you will start enjoying the power of pollen. That's eight six six eight three four eight three five five, or go online to naturebee dot com. Let's go uh, straight back into uh, Stefan Kinsella here. Stefan, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. Now, we, we've been talking about uh, intellectual property law, and, and since you are a patent attorney, you're a great guy to talk to about it. And you have a, you have an unusual stand, likely, for, for uh, patent attorneys, which is that you believe that all intellectual property should be abolished. So uh, It is unusual. Um, I mean, I have come across um, over the years a few patent attorneys who, are, who have my views Maybe not quite as extreme, but a few. But, I mean, I'd say it's 99% are in favor. Um, but it's interesting. I mean, most of the people I, I meet, they, they don't even care to, to debate it. They're not, they're not even interested in the, in the political issue. Um, I mean, if you say you're against the patent system, then they just you know, move on to the next guy at the cocktail party. They, they really don't care. They're like, they're like IRS employees. They don't want to debate the, the income tax system, you know? Hmm. You know, th- this is a huge issue on our show, um, Free Talk Live. We've been doing Free Talk Live since 2002. And whenever the intellectual property laws come up, it it really it sparks a lot of interest. Where the rubber meets the road for most people is often sort of downloads of songs on the Internet. I mean, right. well, popular opinion says that those, you know, shouldn't be people shouldn't be thrown in jail stealing. for those. Right. And uh, but, oh, uh, you think that popular well, opinion I, thinks that those are that's somewhere. Stealing? Well, like practical, practically speaking, people will do it, mm-hmm. but they'll still call it stealing or yeah. pirating or something like that. <laughs> There's a little bit of a, uh, you know, disconnect there. Yeah. There's some kind of guilt where and but when when they have these lawsuits against these people, some of it, sometimes it's one hundred thousand dollars per song. And they seem they to always them. pick the single mothers, too. I mean, whenever. Whenever I buy a song, it's 99 cents. I mean, that's what it should be. You, sh- you shouldn't be able to punish somebody for more than something's worth. Or Stephen? If, if the author wants to give it away for free, the artist. They, they often do. Mm-hmm. Stefan? Well, there, there was a study uh, done by a law professor, John Tehranian, which I have on my website and um, he, uh, a year or two ago. And he, he sort of said, look, let's look at the average activities of a typical web-savvy person, not really a pirate from Sweden or something, but – you know, what we all do every day, we copy pictures, email things to people, um, rip a few songs or maybe burn, rip a few of our CDs. And he calculated, and this is literally not even an exaggeration, that every individual that's an average person using this kind of technology theoretically acquires $4.5 billion of liability every year for what they do. $4.5 so, billion. Wow. Yeah, yeah, per person. So I can't even imagine and, and of, that. of course, that's because these penalties are statutory, and they're, 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 they're – I actually don't understand why someone hasn't come up yet with an Eighth Amendment, you know, cruel and unusual punishment. It defense. seems like it. Yeah, I mean, it's – even if you're going to have copyright law, like you say, 99 cents a song or something reasonable, but not a million or a billion dollars in 99 years in jail. <laughs> It does. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, why do you think those? Why do you think the punishments are so harsh, Stefan? I think it's like the drug war. I think this is becoming a losing war, and so the drug war they just keep increasing the penalties, mm. even though they don't really do any good, but they fall harshly and disproportionately on some people, like 
you know, certain black cultures with the uh, the crack cocaine or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, they just – these things are, are – they're basically not natural law laws. They're malum – Prohibit them, not malum and say, we would call it. They're not natural law. They're just well, the, artificial laws. The government does like to pick on the people who are the most vulnerable in society, I have, I have to say, from observation. Um, I have a question for, for Stefan. Um, there are some people who claim to be libertarians or in, interested in freedom who think that intellectual property law is good or is a necessity or is an actual um, expression of respect for property rights. Right. Um, and I, I kind of wonder, I think that maybe... They're welcome to call in at oh, 855-450-FREE if you want to talk to Stefan about, Stefan about it. <laughs> I think that sometimes, you know, often when they're presented with creative solutions to how artists and producers of content would make money in a world where there was no intellectual property, and maybe some of the arguments about why intellectual property hurts people, sometimes they, they can be persuaded that maybe it's not as good as they thought it was, and it, it's not even actually a correct expression of property rights respect. But um, what do you think about, what do you have to say to them, Stefan? I'm curious. I, I think that a, a lot of them will modulate their tone when they, I mean, they're doing it over time anyway. Um, I think that they have been sold a bill of goods. I mean, Ayn Rand was a big influence on libertarians, Yes, and she was in favor of intellectual property, and it was in the American Constitution. And most libertarians think that America was sort of a, a proto-libertarian example or paradise – not paradise, but you know, like a, yeah. a, good, a good attempt at it. And so they've been, they've been sold this bill of goods just like the rest of the world that it's a type of property right. And they also believe that if you attack intellectual property rights – you're some kind of anti-intellectual, and you're saying that the intellect is not important, and that mm. you know people that are artists or creators or inventors or engineers um, uh, are not as important as you know whoever else can make a make a buck in the market. And I that's used to be true. I used to be one of these guys, a libertarian who believed in um, intellectual property laws, and and for me, <laughs> I had to peel the onion over time. The first question I had to ask myself is, well, these laws are completely arbitrary. I mean, patents last for, what do you say, 18 years or something like that, and mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. and uh, copyrights last for 125, but it used to be 50, and, I, you know, mm-hmm. it, it just changes over time. One has mm-hmm. to ask, you know, what? <laughs> um, h- how is it that great musicians like Mozart existed in the 17th century or, excuse mm-hmm. me, 18th century or whatever, and we're not, and getting rid of intellectual property law today would destroy great musicians when it wasn't um, that way, and at the same time, Shouldn't the inventor of the wheel be? Uh, I mean, you know, we all are progeny, likely of this this great man who or woman who invented the wheel. Shouldn't we all be getting little checks from everybody who uses wheels? I mean, money should be flying wheel. everywhere. We all love the wheel. <laughs> What's that? We all love the wheel. It's Indeed, great. the wheel is great. We should pay for this intellectual property. Free Talk Live. Yep. Talk Live, 855 free. That's the toll-free call-in line for our live Sunday show. It's Mark with you. And Stephanie. And that uh, toll-free line is sponsored by SACL CAI. Again, it's 855-450-3733. And we've been talking to Stefan Kinsella about intellectual property law. And let's go back to, to Stefan. Now, Stefan, I've got this this question for you, and this was one of the things that kind of stumped me on intellectual property before I came over to came over to your side on the issue, which is that I think that I think that most intellectual property law is contrary to freedom, and I think most people really do believe this. They know that the copyright laws and the patent laws in this country are messed up. They tend to believe, well, we need something, and. I, I I now believe that we don't really need anything. That you'll fi- that you'll find innovation um, is best protected, and ser- be- innovation is best served by not having intellectual property. But for instance, what if somebody makes a bubbly brown soda, slaps a red and white label on it, and calls it Coca Cola, and uses it in the script of um, that? I mean, and I purchased this beverage, and in fact, it's not Coca Cola, but it tastes like uh, kale and cabbage mixed up. Well, okay. So your 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 hypo uh, or your example illustrates. Um, so you'll, you'll hear libertarians and others. They're very confused about intellectual property because there's at least four types, and they're very specialized, right? So they mix up trademark and patent and copyright and trade secret. Yep. Uh, and also fraud and defamation law 
and mm. other things all the time. And they'll use one argument for the other, and then, you know, so it's, it gets really confusing. It gets murky, um, sure. Yeah, so, so the example you gave, I mean, I think there's, there's two aspects to it. One is the trade secret aspect, and uh, uh, Coca-Cola, of course, makes their – their product under largely a trade secret. They just keep the ingredients secret. Although the delicious bubbly brown beverage. Yeah, but if you look at Snopes or something, apparently the, the actual formula has been known for a while. Okay. But you know, in reality, you know, a competitor like Pepsi or RC or whatever, you know, some guy competing with another company that's legitimate, they're not going to want to just duplicate what the other guy's doing. They're going to want to have their own name on it. They want to say why they're better, et cetera. So they're not going to want to duplicate it. I mean, they might have a cola, but they're not going to duplicate it. Right. Um, now, on the fraud issue, uh, like if you just call it Coca-Cola and it's not Coca-Cola, I mean, you really don't need intellectual property law for that. You just need fraud law. I mean, if you deceive consumers about who you are and where the product came from, you're going to get sued left and right, and you're never really going to be anyone other than a fly-by-night operator. I mean, it's hard to imagine a large company that rose to success driven by some entrepreneur who is proud and driven – and he, he puts a fake name on it and keeps getting class action lawsuits and think for fraud and things like this. Right. I mean, it just couldn't work. Yeah. So yeah, I, but this is part of the confusion about IP is people think it's fraud and it's really got almost nothing to do with plagiarism or fraud. It's it's really um, an attempt to stop people from competing even when there's no fraud and even when there's no plagiarism. Mm-hmm. Now, one I think that the two areas that really gave me some some problems initially, and one of them is, is completely out of ignorance. I don't really know anything about, uh, you know, say the 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 the, the making of <clears throat> drugs and things like that. But it seems really important to make mm-hmm. drugs. So people's we should lives give, depend on we it. We right? <laughs> should give drug manufacturers every <laughs> opportunity to make mm-hmm. money, and that there's a long R and D cycle and mm-hmm. all these other things. And one of the facts about the R and D cycle, as I understand it, is that it takes hundreds of billions of dollars to get through the right. FDA process. So right. if that was removed, then, you know, the, the drug wouldn't companies, cost so it wouldn't cost so much, to market. they wouldn't need to uh, protect their, uh, their R&D quite so much. So you would see companies, uh, you know, they, they'd be competing more and things like that. And the right. fact is that the drug companies just a few decades ago weren't using intellectual property as the bludgeon that they are using it as right. now. And that's what it's really become. You know, they, what do they call them, uh, copyright trolls or something like that mm-hmm. when it comes to... Uh, that just buy up all these patents or file all these patents and then sue companies. And it's really just a shell company, right? Is that right, Stefan? It is. Uh, the, the patent troll situation is a little bit different than the um, than, than the pharmaceutical case. The pharmaceutical it's getting case close. Is, it, it is close, of course, because uh, well, let, let me put it this way. Um, I think here's the best way to look at the pharmaceutical case. Um, people hold this out all the time as this is the best case, you, best utilitarian case for patents. You'd have to have it, etc. Well, if it's just a, a monetary issue, if you think about the cost the state imposes on these companies in the first place through regulations, through the FDA process, through taxes, um, et cetera. Just imagine lifting, you know, half of those regulations. Then these, these pharmaceutical companies would have much more wealth to invest in R&D in the first place, so you would need to give them an artificial patent monopoly to make a little extra profit in the first place. Huh. Government <laughs> created a problem, and then they tried to solve it. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is what the government does. You know, they, they cause a problem. It's like the welfare system, right? They, they cause unemployment and impoverishment, and then they say, well, we have to have a, a government safety net to help all these people, including giving them employment in the Army, which once you join, you can't leave. So basically, we, they say we have a volunteer Army now, but it's not really volunteer because they force people into it because of impoverishment. And then they can't leave. So we still have an involuntary army in, in right. a way. <laughs> and um, oh, go, 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 uh, well, I was just going to say that the other the other thing that kind of stumped me on, on intellectual property were blockbuster movies. It costs a mm-hmm. lot of money to produce a big movie. Mm-hmm. And somehow, I guess I just didn't I thought it would kill the blockbuster movie industry mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. by getting rid of uh, intellectual property. And now, what do you have to say to that? Well, there may be a few um, artifacts of society that we're used to now that could not su- su- survive in a free society. Blockbuster movies may be one of them. I don't think so, actually, because you can always um, you know, show these movies in the theater and make, make a large profit from showing them. Uh, just because you don't make a profit on the second, third, fourth level – of uh, you know of, of the rights after the movie gets leaked, et cetera, is not relevant. You just have to cover your costs. So it's possible, but you know, um, 
again, if you reduce the taxes on these companies and the people, we'd have so much more wealth in the first place. And it's hard to say we can justify censorship because we want blockbuster movies. I mean, imagine Thomas Jefferson and uh, Madison framing these provisions in the Constitution. I realize Jefferson wasn't part of that process, but he was the first patent commissioner. Um, I mean, would they have said we, we, the, the government is justified in giving these monopoly privileges so that we can have blockbuster Hollywood movies? I mean, it makes <laughs> <laughs> that's the one thing we're used for, for yeah. you know, for for for, for, boy, for propaganda by the by the government against the Soviets, et cetera. And, and one wonders if the whole movie industry has become as big and um, as it is simply because of of copyright law as it exists. I mean, do we really, uh, you know, and society is creating, say, um, and I, I don't. Want who to target here? Tom Hanks. They're creating mm-hmm. these uh, actors, Dustin Hoffman's, these actors who are mm-hmm. incredibly skilled at their trade. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. do I mean, you know, what would life be like if that guy made sort of uh, the same amount as a doctor makes? I mean, he'd still have a great living. He'd still be practicing his trade in an excellent way. He just, um, you know, there just wouldn't be the the Paris Hiltons of the world <laughs> that are sort of famous for being famous. You know, this kind well, of, and think of and think of how many actors are in the business because they love acting. I mean. A lot, the vast majority of them make a pittance, right? <laughs> and they stay in that profession. It's the, same with, it's the same with novelists and literature, of course. I mean, most of them never made a lot of money, and they still don't. The studios make the money. Mm-hmm. And all the great literature of history and, and art and, uh, and, and music was made not because of a monopoly privilege granted by the state, but because of love of it or passion for it or some other uh, muse. And there's actually studies out there about this that show this. But, um, you know, it, basically the only two large cases for IP is Hollywood blockbusters and the pharmaceutical industry. So you would think that if you were really sincere and honest, you would say, let's get rid of patent and copyright except for blockbuster movies and and pharmaceutical drugs. But they don't do that. They use this as an example for a general intellectual property right, yeah. which makes no sense whatsoever. I'd like to point out that sort of in the world that you're talking about, if I were to go out on the street and hawk um, you know, movies, I'm trying to think of a big one, uh, Captain America, I just saw that in the theaters. If I were mm-hmm. to hawk Captain America DVDs that were printed up to look just like the DVDs that the Captain America, uh, that uh, whatever, I don't know, Sony <coughs> Pictures, I think it was, um, mm-hmm. that whatever the movie company was that put Captain America out, Marvel Marvel movies, then I would be defrauding the person to whom I'm selling, and those people could bring suit against me. So I'm still sort of breaking the law or agreement in society in the same in, in that same way. Absolutely. And so, you know, if, if you know what you're getting and you're okay with the cheaper version that's a knockoff, that's one thing. Let's talk about knockoffs when we get back. Mm-hmm. Free Talk Live. Talk Live, 855-453. If you've got any calls and questions for Stefan Kinsella, he is available to you for this segment. And um, before we go on, are the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? No. Go to learnliberty.org slash FTL and see a video by Steve Horowitz that shows that the rich are getting richer and so are the poor. Find out what income mobility is. Find it all out at learnliberty.org slash FTL. When you're there, check out the Liberty Academy link on the right-hand side of the page. It's a course for people who want free online, continuing education and rights, economics, philosophy, and liberty. It's learnliberty.org slash FTL. When you watch these videos, share them with your friends. Share them on your Facebook. They're awesome. <laughs> learnliberty.org. Yep, great stuff, very concise. And while you're on the internet, you should go to shrine.freetalklive.com to check out the Shrine of Female Listeners. It's a bunch of ladies who have taken the time to send in their pictures to show that not just men listen to talk radio, it's women too, and sometimes they even host the show. Excellent. (laughs) Stefan Kinsella, um, patent attorney, are you with us? I'm I'm back, yes. Okay. So I guess I have a a question about, uh, we were talking about intellectual property and how people can be duped uh, into buying things that uh, are not what they expect them to be. But 
you know, I have seen, I, I've heard of such things as, say, sunglasses that are not, they, they look like, that they're made to look exactly like sunglasses that are 10 times their price. You mean Jokelys? Jokelys, right. <laughs> Folklies. Uh, you know, these kind of things. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, they have the big O on the side. I mean, they're, they're made precisely like these other things. They don't have the quality mm-hmm. level, and that much is clear. And mm-hmm. I think that largely people don't, think they're getting real Oakleys when they pay $10 for knockoff Oakleys or, you know, this is true with handbags and all kinds of things. How, tell, tell me your perspective on this because it, it befuddles me. So, so, so let's say, let's take a simple example first. Like, you know, you want to buy Colgate or Crest toothpaste. You typically go down to a Kroger or grocery store and they have a reputation and you know, if they're carrying, you know, counterfeit Colgate or, or Crest that's actually fake and you can't tell the difference, then then you're going to stop patronizing that store. So you can see a natural market mechanism for people to verify the source of goods, you know, that you want to make sure you're getting what, what's being represented. Now, in, in the case you're describing, which is similar to the, you know, the $20 Rolex watches on the corner mm-hmm. and the, and the, and the uh, you know, the $30 Louis Vuitton bags. I can't believe I didn't person. mention that. <laughs> you should have absolutely <laughs> exactly. mentioned that. Go ahead. But, I mean, in these cases, the customer knows what they're getting, uh, I believe. They're not being defrauded. They actually want the cheaper product, and this is fine. Um, so there's no fraud there. See, I focus on patenting copyright because in those cases, there's almost no redeeming feature. There is no redeeming feature of these. They're, they're monopolies. There's no fraud. There's no plagiarism. There's no trade secret violation, et cetera. Um, but in the case of, in the case of trade, trademark, you could justify a part of it because in some cases, the consumer would be, be defrauded. But again, as I said, that could be covered by fraud law. Yeah. Um, but in the case you described, there's really no consumer fraud. And 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 the, and and the the market can take care of that aspect of it. Gotcha. Uh, let's go. To, let's take a call here. We've got Ben in Wisconsin calling in from uh, XM. Ben. Ben, can you hear me? Ben, going once. Board up. I am not getting any audio from Ben. We've, Some... we've been trying to get a hold of him. <laughs> Mark, <laughs> Mark uh, it, it, let me mention one thing you might not have heard of with respect to what you just mentioned. Um, about a year ago, there was a case where Omega or Omega or Omega, as James Bond pronounces it, you know, the watch company. <laughs> uh-huh. They were selling these watches in um, uh, Bolivia or some South American country for like you know a thousand dollars, and they were selling them in the U.S. for. Two thousand dollars because of geographic, you know, price discrimination. Yeah, this mm-hmm. happens. Now, yep. now they're all legitimate watches, but someone said, "Hey, let's let's have arbitrage." So they they would Costco actually hired some guy to go buy them down in Paraguay <laughs> or wherever it was. Yep. And they yeah. were selling them for a little bit less than the, the retail price here, but they made a big profit because they're, you know, Costco sold them cheaper down there. So what Costco did was they put a a, a globe logo on the back of the watch that was a, a unique logo which was copyrighted, and then they sued Costco for copyright infringement. The and watch company for selling, did? For selling them in the U.S. And Costco said, well, you sold the watch. It's your watch. It's not a copyright infringement because of the, what's called the first sale doctrine, which means you can only stop the first sale of the item, then you can resell a book or whatever, right? Hmm. Well, the court said, well, the first sale wasn't in the United States, so it doesn't count. So they could actually stop that sale. And this was last year. And at the time, some people, including myself, said the problem with this is it could jeopardize libraries, which are loaning out books, which were bought overseas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, or resale of books on Amazon or eBay, which were bought overseas. And just about two weeks ago, another case came out where there's a grad student who lived in the U.S. He came from, I can't remember the country, some foreign country. And uh, Wiley, which is a publisher, sells cheaper copies of these textbooks overseas, mm. and they put them on cheaper paper. So he was getting his family to ship them overseas over to the U.S., and he resold them over here. Mm. Um, and he made about a million bucks awesome. over, over a few years. Wow. And then Wiley sued him for copyright infringement, and just last week the court said, well, the first sale doctrine doesn't apply because it wasn't first sold in the U.S., so he had he, he lost six hundred thousand dollars in a suit oh, because he sold books wow. that Wiley sold in this foreign country that you weren't know. intended for sale here. So this is how copyright and patent law can be used as a as a 
a barrier to free trade. It's a barrier to trade, and it's a barrier to innovation. Let's go back to Ben. We've got him on the line here. Ben? Yes. Okay. okay. Your question, you please. Yes, your question or comment, please. Well, uh, I just tuned in, and I wanted to make sure I was hearing you right, that uh, in regards to intellectual property, I, I am a uh, you know freelance uh, uh, landscape photographer, and from what I'm able to understand is that you believe that I shouldn't have any copyright to what it is that I produce. Stefan? Is that correct? Uh, yes, I do think that's correct. And that's because you shouldn't, if you decide to make information available to the public, then you've made that public. Um, there's really no difference between information about, you know, how, how, how tall you are or your personal life or anything you want to reveal. If you want to sell a mousetrap, well, the there's nothing creative about how tall I am, but if I bring my talents to bear and you see this picture and you decide that that's something that you'd like to have in your house or in order to, you know, promote your product or service, why should you just then be able to lift that off the Internet and employ that without any remuneration to me? Well, I think the basic reason is because it doesn't take anything from you that you own. It doesn't take from you the pattern of information. It doesn't take your property. Basically, it's this is what is invo- human society is about. This, now, this is how I look at it. Humans learn from each other. We all build on and draw on the, the body of knowledge that we've learned. We all base our actions on things that we've learned from others. When we compete with other people, we see what they do and we emulate it. Maybe maybe we do it better, maybe we do it worse. There is nothing okay, well, wrong with what would, learning. What you propose would be my motivation to produce this. I've, I've got now, I'm driving back from a self-assigned shoot. I have over $2,000 in expenses and over a week away from my home, and I'm going to produce this just to, what, educate you, to, to better your life. And well, ben, I, ben, can I interrupt? Yeah. I, would, I would think that it would be... If someone used your photos and if they gave you credit, which they should do if they're a polite person, you know, it would be a great way to promote your work, and maybe you would get more contracts out of that. Well, I mean, if I'm not getting paid for it anyway, I mean, if it's, if it's free to anyone... That well, wants- hey, nobody said, nobody said you shouldn't get paid. I think uh, Stefan can address that, right? I mean, look, Ben, uh, you have to say that when people are used to a certain way of doing business because the government system allows it, and then they get used to that way of doing business, but... Uh, you can't say that the the function of government is to allow you to make landscape photographs. I mean, it's 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 not the function of government to make sure that we can have enough landscape photographs. No, but it is the function of government to protect what it is that I've invested to produce, to make well, your life more enjoyable, or well, in order to promote. Let me your jump product. in on that, Ben. Um, my question is, you know, what arbitrary period of time am I obligated to respect that? I mean. Can I not then reproduce the Mona Lisa or the cave drawings well, and cons or any of well, these that's other things? That's legislative. And I mean, it is legislative. Know, we, it absolutely is. Yeah. It's a group of people who are sitting down and saying, yeah, I think 125 years is good. What do you think, Jim? I don't know. Give me a million dollars. I'll think about it. <laughs> and that's how they do it. Exactly. Ben, I appreciate the call. we got to go. <laughs> it's the top of the hour. Uh, Free Talk Live. We're going to hold Stefan Kinsella over. Um, there's just too much demand. So, uh, Stefan, if you if you would be so kind as to hold through, we've got about eight minutes. The market has spoken. Free talk live. Sure, I'll be here. <laughs> Free Talk Live, 855-450-FREE. That's the SACL toll-free call-in line, 855-450-3733. You can give us a call right now. We're talking to Stefan Kinsella about, he's an he's a patent attorney. We're talking about intellectual property and how he would like to see it abolished. Uh, this is Free Talk Live. We are live on a Sunday evening, so if you're hearing us on the radio or XM, you can call in at 855-450-3733 free and talk to us uh, about Stefan Kinsella and then uh, once we're once we're done with Stefan we'll go on to talk about whatever Stefan are you there can you hear me 
I'm here, Mark. Excellent. Now, um, Stephanie, you had a question for uh, for Stefan, and I wanted to make sure that you get a chance to, to ask that. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. So, Stefan, I am a student right now, but I'm pursuing an MD and a PhD. I'm in school, grad, graduate school. And the reason why I wanted to do that program was so that I could discover new new cures for diseases. And mm-hmm. I'm, I think a lot about intellectual property as it relates to drugs and Um, pharmaceuticals and cures and stuff. And I've decided that um, it would be very difficult for me to work in this industry because it's just so heavily regulated and so involved with the FDA and even gets government funding. And, and of course the intellectual property is another aspect to it, but you know, I've, I've spent some time thinking about how I could make money at this. If I found something that could cure a disease, how could I do like a, like a, something that would prevent me from uh, getting sued by other people, like like something I could release into the public domain, but uh, not have other people patent my thing and then sue me for using it. Is that possible? Can you talk about options that would allow me to do well, that? that that's a, uh, it's a good question. It's interesting. I mean, <laughs> it's a blend of practicality and ethics. I mean, ethically, I sympathize with you. It's difficult in some industries to totally shun patents, et cetera, if you want to be part of the game, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are actually some emerging models based upon sort of the GPL license or the open source or the CC model. Right. In fact, just a couple of days ago, I wrote a blog post, um, something I've been brainstorming about for years, and I call it the Patent Defense League. Mm. And when I posted this, someone told me there's two law professors in California at Berkeley who are working on what they call the uh, defensive patent license, which is similar to what I proposed. And the basic idea is that people that want to have an open source type culture could somehow dedicate their patent rights to some common pool, which could be used um, to among the pool so they would agree not to sue each other, et cetera. Mm. My idea is a little bit broader. It's It's basically – You know, imagine a thousand small companies coming together and they say, listen, we're going to enter into this agreement where every one of our patents will be available to other members to use defensively against anyone that sues us, just defensively. And to my mind, this is the only legitimate uh, purpose of of patents as a libertarian, which is why I help my company pursue them. If someone sues me, I can sue them back. Um, And by the way, as as an aside, with respect to your question, you could – publish your ideas. You could make them public right away. And once you make something public in a reliable way where you can verify that it was made public, then at that point in time, that serves as prior art, which would prevent anyone else from patenting that idea in the future. Mm. Um, you know, but the problem is, I mean, th- th- that's not foolproof. I mean, uh, it's not easy to do that. Right. Um, and someone else could already have co-invented that at the same time a year before or maybe at the same time and have a patent pending. That's not a foolproof way. Well, I have, I, say, that, mm, <laughs> I have to say that I really like the idea of open source medicine, you know, things that could make drugs a lot cheaper and more available to patients who might need them. And maybe even things that, um, I don't know, could be easily produced. And so there could be a lot of different generics. I think it's emerging. It's emerging as a norm, not only as a, a legal thing. I mean, mm. uh, if you think about uh, like, like just Ethernet as an example, Ethernet, uh, someone persuaded... Uh, I forgot the company, Xerox, I think it was, or someone to make Ethernet open source so it was adopted, right? And the PC itself is spread because it was open source. And now we have Linux and things like this and the GNU and things like this. So things actually take off when they are open. And if if you make it private, you can kill it unless you have the resources yes. of an Apple behind it, which Apple has the support of IP behind them, which is maybe one reason Apple is so successful. I love Apple. I'm an Apple guy. But... But the idea of suing could... your customers, it just doesn't seem compatible. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, I, I want to get to Kurt. I want to yeah. get to an, an, another call here real quick, if we could. Uh, Kurt in New Hampshire. Kurt? Yes, sir. Hi, good evening. All is well. Uh, another, su- another Sunday show. Um, I wanted to talk about that art, the uh, photographer who called saying, if he put so much effort into this investment to make this photograph, doesn't it deserve to be protected? But that's just the labor theory of value being restated. Yeah. If I make a huge investment in writing, say, the, the great American novel, and I take 20 years and nobody likes it, I don't make any money. So right. there's no – I can't go to the government and say, excuse me, but nobody bought this. It's 
I, I need money well, 20 I, years of my life. I down. think his concern is that the people will use the pictures and then and uh, that he won't that be they able will to... like them, and but they won't compensate him. And I can see that this is the case. If somebody sees a beautiful picture on the Internet and wants, you know, wants to have that picture or whatever, um, I can see that. But he can also write sample or he can write his name and logo across it kind of in that um, that watermark way. Or, or he can make yeah. a low resolution version publicly available and then maybe people would pay for a really high resolution or pay for his prints that he's signed and produced. I mean, there's lots of ways that an artist can make money off of uh, something. And, you know, it, I think it was particularly important to highlight the fact that if somebody does use one of his photographs in whatever way, it's not preventing him from using the same photograph. He can still sell it to other people, put it on his website. It, they haven't taken anything away from him. And, and, so, and the, the fact that somebody will use a picture doesn't mean that they would actually be willing to pay for a picture. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I listen to the radio and I'm listening to um, Crazy Train one more time doesn't mean <laughs> that I would be willing to go out and buy Crazy Train. Or even if I'm singing along doesn't mean I'd be willing to go out and buy Crazy Train. I promise you, I'm never going in my life to buy Crazy Train. And right. So, so it's not, it's not as if playing it on the radio is taking away business from Mozzie Osbourne. Right, Mark? He actually gets a little spiff every time. People spend a, people spend a lot of money on classical music. They do, and people perform classical music, and there are entire orchestras that perform classical music. Yet that music is completely in the public domain. The, la the recording from 1912, that was the absolute perfect recording was supposed to have destroyed the music industry because once there was one good recording, no one would ever do it again. And yet that's not what's happened. People replay the same music over and over. There are new interpretations, variations on a theme. Nobody sued Paganini for doing variations on a theme by Beethoven or whatever. Right. And well, this, this so many things were supposed to be the... So many things were supposed to be the killers of the last. Television was going to kill movies. Um, talkies were going to kill silent films. And you know, maybe, maybe that maybe there's the argument for talkies. VCRs, eight track tapes. They they yeah. all are uh, threats to radio. Know, supposed to have been dead flow. decades ago. I mean, right. <laughs> the the photographer could do exactly what the painters of the old old days did when there was no copyright, and that's do things by contract. If he's if his eye is really so good, someone's going to come to him and say, "We want a great picture of our corporate headquarters." For our logo. Can you go get one for us? Exactly. And, and putting his get, work out there for free. He, putting his work out there for free. His business. <laughs> he'll be getting business because he's good at it. Yep. And that's yeah. the point. And, and willing to do the work. I mean, because there's pe people that are good that are h difficult as heck to work with. So you, there's several different <laughs> ways. Um, I mean, there's customer service and all these other things. Kurt, I really appreciate, appreciate the call. Stephan, do you have comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that his. I think he's right about the labor theory of value. I don't want to get too abstruse here, but um, I think that does inform a lot of this reasoning. But basically, the, the job of any artistic or creative person is not really fundamentally different than any entrepreneur in the market. Every entrepreneur has to say, "I'm going to produce this product or this service. Can I make a profit on it?" And they always realize there are free rider costs. There are there are. Uh, cost of exclusion. Yep. So let, let me let me give an example. The 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 drive-in theaters originally in the U.S., which were popular in the fifties, et cetera, they had loudspeakers, and so people would sit on the hills nearby, and they would listen and watch for free. Mm. So they came up with the little speakers you had to pay for, right next to the cars. Mm. That's a cost of exclusion, and they made it work. That's the job of every entrepreneur. Makes sense, Stefan. Would you uh, like to, to to continue for another segment? Be happy to. Great. I want to ask about baking. <laughs> baking. Recipes. Hmm. Recipes. Gotcha. <laughs> free Talk Live, 855-450-FREE. Free Talk Live, 855-450-FREE. That's the SACL toll-free call-in line, 855-450-3733. For those of you without the little letters on your telephone telephones, uh, St Stephanie, please tell me about uh, how people can find out more news about Free Talk Live. Well, they can go to news.freetalklive.com to get emailed updates, follow us on Twitter, and friend us on Facebook. Excellent. If you're looking for camping, hunting, or shooting gear, Man Venture Outpost carries knives, ammunition, scopes, binoculars, laser sights, tactical flashlights, fish finders, 
and boating yeah. equipment. Man Venture out and much more, by the way, name brands uh, down to you know more low cost versions. ManVentureOutpost.com. They're family owned and members in good standing of the Better Business Bureau. Some prices are so low they can't even be mentioned on the air. You can get an additional five percent off with coupon code FTL. Get it quick. Get it from ManVentureOutpost.com. Don't forget to use coupon code FTL. Stefan Kinsella? I'm here. Now, uh, we have uh, been picking your brain about intellectual property, and people should be able to, f- to read more about what you're talking about. Where can they go to get all your uh, elucidation on, on these ideas? Uh, they go to my um, C4, that's the number 4, SIF.org, Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, C4SIF.org. Center for the Study of Innovation. What is it? Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. Innovative Freedom. I now, like that. It does sound good. Let's go to, uh, you know, before we go on with uh, asking you more questions, we got another call here. Let's go to Daryl in Texas. Daryl? Hey, I uh, wanted to talk about the sunglasses real quick, then get the copyright. We uh, talked about Jokely's. Company. Yeah, well, the Oakley's, the Jokely, and pretty much every other name brand sunglasses, and even the knockoff other brand are pretty much all made by one company. Yeah, I've heard this before. Mm -hmm. What's it called? Uh, I I believe Luxotica. Luxotica. I posted a link on uh, Stephanie's Facebook. Okay. Well, not the whole uh, world can can see that. (laughs) Right. Well, not everybody can see that right now, but uh, you you can show Mark uh, that way you figure out how it's actually pronounced. But uh, I wanted to talk about copyright, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Stefan is a fan of Creative Commons. Stefan, are you a fan of Creative Commons? Yeah, I think Creative Commons is a great thing. Of course, um, GNU and Creative Commons could not exist without copyright in the first place because these are licenses, right? And license is the right to – you're granting someone permission to do something. But people Mm -hmm. don't need permission to do something unless the law otherwise stops them. So without copyright, all these licenses would just disappear. Daryl? Would that go for the creator's endorsed mark and uh, copy heart that Nina Paley has come up with? No, actually, I I, I know Nina Paley. She's on the board of the C4SIF that I mentioned earlier. She's a friend of mine. She's great. Uh, And the creator endorsed mark relies upon fraud or, or trademark. It does not rely upon copyright. So that actually could survive in a copyright and patent-free world, as could copyright, which is, I think, uh, Eric, uh, Eric Johnson's idea, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's just the idea that you put a mark on your product saying, please tell people who came up with this, you know, share the love. Mm. You know, and I, I think I think people respond to this. People yeah. want uh, the you know the manufacturers of some people, so, en- enough especially, people, especially if a uh, person who invented or made a product is kind enough to give it away for free and maybe have a freemium business model or something. I think people will want to reciprocate that kindness by giving them credit for their work, and Dar- that's all that a lot of inventors are after. Daryl, thank you for the call. I think that you know it's going to require some change in the world. I don't think that the Barbara Streisands of the world would be able to uh, survive this change. For instance, people who uh, you know make it on just the recordings of their music and then go live in a big mansion and uh, are never heard from again. <laughs> I think that musicians likely would have to perform, and I think most musicians want to do that. And Don't most of them make most of their money off of live um, performances and things like T-shirt sales and things like that? At some point, they make more money just sitting around and playing golf. Mm. Stephen? <laughs> yeah, I think they do. I mean, uh, uh, who, who, who is the singer of the original Happy Birthday song you guys mentioned earlier? I yeah, mean, nobody knows. There's some air sitting in a house somewhere collecting hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe millions every year because of the song Happy Birthday. Right. Yeah. And if one, one would have to ask oneself, how many heirs are there and how many people, productive people, are really taken out of society and just put to, you know, put out there for other people to milk their money from them or whatever it is that they're doing. I, you know, I mean, these people may have been really creative people that would have added something to society, but the very fact that they were given stipends of hundreds of, of a hundred or two hundred or a, thousand, a million dollars a year mm-hmm. just takes them out of the, out of play. Yeah, that's not really... Well, we all, I think we also have to realize that the government always distorts society. I mean, yes. causes a distorting effect. And the fact that 
uh, you know, people go into innovating in certain areas because they can have patents over that, but they can't get patents in other areas like mathematical algorithms causes a distortion in the whole industry of, of research and development, right? And the same thing with music and, and, and creative, creative works. And how many companies would have would never, um, you know, are never existing just because the cost to get all these patents and to pay patent lawyers are so prohibitively expensive? I mean, I've heard of companies, uh, you know, startup biotech companies that have spent all of their venture capital startup funds on just paying IP lawyers, and they're well, not. We, we, yeah, we, we, we didn't get a chance to get into this, but <laughs> one one result of the patent system is that. Larger companies can afford the lawyers and all these things, and so they basically cross-license with each other. They don't sue each other because they're afraid to get countersued for patents. But the smaller companies and the individuals cannot afford to even get into the market. So basically the effect of patent law is to create oligopolies, small areas of concentrated uh, in the drug industry, in the, in the music industry, in the smartphone industry, all these areas. I mean think of Apple and RIM and Microsoft. Uh, I mean, basically, they have a monopoly because a small guy cannot help. Cannot. I mean, at, uh, Microsoft, uh, Google just spent 12.5 billion dollars to acquire the assets of Motorola Mobility, primarily for the patents. So they wow. spent at least six, six or ten billion dollars, billion, just like two weeks ago, just to acquire 17,000 patents, so <sighs> they could fend off lawsuits from Apple and RIM and Microsoft and others. That's such a wasteful, tragic, yeah. yeah. They're paying that for pieces of paper. (laughs) and ones that. but the point is no small company could ever hope to do that. So That's what happens is the the lawyers, even even when they're just these patent trolls or from these big companies, the lawyers that that come down upon these little guys that that are just trying to innovate and do something, you know, they, they can't even defend themselves. They never get the opportunity to defend themselves because defending themselves costs a heck of a lot more than the several hundred thousand dollars it does to just settle, at which point yeah. their company may very well just go out of business rather than pay. I, I mean, this has and, happened to me, in fact. <laughs> of course, and not only that, you, you have these people who say, well, let's fix the system by making it lose or pays. But that wouldn't fix anything either because let's say you're a small company and a big company sues you for copyright, maybe a copyright troll like Wright Haven or, or a patent troll like Intellectual Ventures or LoadSys. They sue you for patent or copyright infringement. And let's say you're in the right. Even if you're in the right, you can't afford $3 million. Or you lose either total. way. Yeah. yeah. It costs so three million bucks to get in the ring. Pay. Indeed. Yeah. Stefan Kinsella, uh, thank you very much. Plug your website uh, real quick. StefanKinsella.com and C4SIF.org. Appreciate it. Thank you. You listen to Free Talk Live, 855 450 free. Talk Live's live Sunday edition. It's Mark and Stephanie. Give us a call at 855-450-3733. That's the SACL toll-free call-in line. You can call in and talk about anything you want. We just had Stefan Kinsella on. If you want to hear that interview, you can get it. It'll be available this evening at freetalklive.com where, well, we have how many how many what th- five years worth of uh, audio available at archives.freetalklive.com stephanie oh definitely yep um mp3 archives actually go back to 2006 all for free what what, what more what could sh- you ask for what show what show does that for you i mean I come on think of a single one who loves Except you free talk live <laughs> in free talk live we talk about investing in gold and silver on a pretty regular basis either as a hedge against inflation investment barter currency but we've teamed up with Midas Resources to offer you some really great rates on some hand-picked gold and silver pieces. Everybody on the radio is selling gold right now. The trick is find pieces, that still, you know, whether they're coins or uh, bullion or whatever they are, find them that are comparable to other ones. So you can comparison shop. If you can't comparison shop, they're just going to sell you anything at any rate. You've got to buy low so you can sell high. Go to Before you buy, go to gold.freetalklive.com. Check the rates there. Compare them to other, other places. I think you'll find that these are the best rates on the internet that you can get from one of the, the major retailers. It's gold.freetalklive.com. 
Com. Now, Stephanie, you've got a story that says that buying Chinese benefits Americans. Yes. And this, is, get, uh, this is ludicrous. <laughs> well, if you go to a Tea Party rally, like this article says, then they'll probably be saying buy American and kind of using these emotional appeals to try to get people to do that. But sure, manufacturing's great for the country, right? You can't have an economy without manufacturing, we're told. That's what they say. But when you look a little bit deeper into the principles involved, then you'll find out that that's not actually so. It makes you wonder how people that don't manufacture things ha- actually have households. I mean, how do they have personal economies if they're not <laughs> manufacturing things? I mean, you don't manufacture anything, do you? Uh, you offer no. a service. Uh, yeah, I'm a talk radio host, right? Well, that, that and, and you're, you're basically slave labor for the medical community until yes. they give you your MD, <laughs> exactly. right? <laughs> yeah. So tell me. Okay, so this article is from the digitaljournal.com and says, uh, a new study released by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, uh, interesting, I didn't know that they did studies, but apparently they do. Now they've got plenty of money. Shows that when Americans buy products labeled made in China, 55 cents on the dollar goes to people in the United States. Now, you've, I've always said this. I mean, you know, once, once it gets here, it has to be driven around by Americans. It has to be sold by Americans. It has to be loaded by Americans. It has to be all kinds of things that happen. Americans Precisely. have to have to do this. Yeah, and oftentimes products that are manufactured, frankly, Americans don't want to do that work, especially for the pay that's involved. Right? Well, you know, the, the, so there are there are some manufacturing things that are done in the United States, mm-hmm. uh, cars. Um, certainly, you can't really ship houses. The, yeah, isn't the big it funny ticket things that like, isn't it? Toyotas are as a percentage of the of the cost of the car, more of the car is made in America than is Ford. <laughs> yes. yeah. Oftentimes you'll find, uh, you know, the Ford's made in Mexico and Canada and things like that, too. Yeah. And th- these are these are realities. I mean, it sounds American, but, you know, is it that much more American? Well, and, you know, I always wonder about things when people have these emotional appeals. Oh, buy American. You're doing a good thing. You're being patriotic. Yep. You know, the general consensus, uh, the, the 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 common sense is common sense is usually not common and often not sense. Uh, and, you know, I it, you, you've got to look in deeper. You've got to use critical thinking. And I well, think that's that, that's exactly it. It's like if if it were such a good idea, if it if it made sense to buy things that were made in America all the time, then people wouldn't need to use these emotional arguments to try to convince people to buy American. Can it you would just buy stand a on its own merits. Can you even buy a toaster that is made in America? Uh, I haven't been in the toaster market lately, but (laughs) I don't think you can. I mean, there's so many things that aren't made in the United States. There are some things you can still get some bicycles that are made in the United States, but a lot of things just aren't manufactured over here at all. Well, and how do you know? I mean, products will often have stamped on them things like made in the USA, but how do you really verify that? And is it 100 percent? I think if you care, um, you will find, you know, one of these third party certifiers that will Mm -hmm. certify something is made in America in some way or another. They'll have a a stamp on it that will certify. And I think that I I would trust those people if they're you know, likely if they're making that stamp, they care enough about these things. You can you can delve even further. I'm sure there's competing stamps that say made in America. But this is this is a way to uh, to tell third third party certification. Yeah, well, it's a selling point for a lot of things, but should it be? I mean, for me, I don't know. I I don't know either, and I think that you know people. I like it the increases idea of people. buying locally, but uh-huh. I don't know that buying in America really matters. I mean, one one question I would have is: I, I live closer to Toronto than I live to Miami. <laughs> so, is something manufactured in Miami? I mean, aren't I buying local by buying the Toronto thing? Or I, right. I live actually probably closer to Montreal than I live to Toronto. I mean, so these, well, these some fellows things... that speak French over there make it, making something. Should I buy them? I mean, if geography is what matters, yeah. then. You probably can't get strawberries in the middle of December that are grown in Toronto, but you might be able to get them grown from California. Indeed. I mean, there's just some things that it makes sense not to buy local, especially seasonal things like that. And, uh, you know, I I think that people buy things because they want to increase their standard of living, right? And they want mm-hmm. to live a good life that fulfills all their things that they want. And, you know, <laughs> if I can make someone better off who lives in China or who lives in Canada or Germany or wherever... That's great. You know, they made a product that I liked and wanted to buy, so they should get money. If I can buy one bunch of bananas that was uh, grown uh, locally, which doesn't make much sense in New Hampshire, um, you know, but if I can buy one b- bunch of bananas for for the cost that it would be two bunch of b- bunches of bananas that were grown in, say, Brazil, but transported and sold and uh, American businesses, where fifty five cents on that dollar goes to American people. I mean, it, you know, how 
I, I shouldn't I do what benefits me right. and benefits my family? Isn't that the first order of business? The fact yes. that it's lower prices every day, mm-hmm. you know, and and these are these are important ways that you can help you and yours. I'm not saying I buy all my food locally mm-hmm. because I care about the morality of how my food is manufactured, and I'm concerned about big agribusiness and their effect on the environment. It is easier to keep an eye on your foods when you buy from local producers. That's for sure. Indeed, but, but I think I'm that- saying why is it why is it bad to buy from someone in another country? Isn't it a voluntary exchange? Why is it better to buy from an American? It just seems like nationalism or even racism, frankly, to me. It can be. I mean, you know, certainly Americans come in all colors, but some people will. Yeah. <laughs> Ethnocentrism. Is, they it, do. But like, why are they better? Why should you patronize them just because they were born in a I country? Guess the, I idea, could see- the idea is uh, maybe underlying it all is the taxes that person pays on what you buy, then go back to benefit you and yours in your community, which, you know, may, well, I, I live in a state that say, um, uh, you know, they. There shouldn't be taxes. Uh, and, uh, agreed. <laughs> I think argument. taxes, taxes are money. It's money stolen by the government. Yeah. But the. You know, the state that I live in pays money in. It doesn't get money out. Some states, you know, get money out of the government. What, you know, why why should I be dying to uh, make sure that some other state gets money? Mm, indeed. So I'm going to just go on and read the punchline of this article. It says the truth from the study, according to the study, is that buying from China actually benefits Americans more than the Chinese. According to this study, a, a majority of the uh, products labeled made in China goes to people and businesses in the United States. In fact, 55% of the cost of the product goes to services provided in the United States like transportation, rent, salaries of sales paper, uh, sorry, salespeople, profits for shareholders, and marketing of the product. And, you know, I, I, I just wonder what people think about that. That's a lot of, you know, it's a, a more of the money on products made in China go mm-hmm. to Americans Over than half. Chinese. And it's interesting because another finding of this study was that uh, the average take for Americans from imports from other nations is 36 cents on the dollar compared to 55 cents when the product comes from China. So for some reason, you know, either the cost of products from China is lower to begin with and it mm-hmm. gets marked up more when it goes to the U.S. I see. Or something like that. Uh, it doesn't speculate as to why, but for some reason, China Chinese goods are particularly efficient at uh, enriching Americans. Maybe there's no fair the trade stuff chain. going on in uh, in China. Hmm. I wonder if the fair trade stuff throws off the uh, formula for coming from other countries. That's you know, a great question. voluntarily pay more for, say, coffee or sugar or something right. like that, basically to give to people that are part of this fair trade thing. And I guess exclude the people, you know, the, the poor farmers who aren't. Yeah. Well, another thing is fair trade encourages people to get into that market, whereas maybe there are too many bananas already and the price is low for that reason. Free Talk Live, 855-450-FREE. Talk Live, 855-450 free. That's the SACL toll-free call in line, 855-450-3733. And what is SACL CAI, you ask? Well, it's a company that, <laughs> that does you know collections. I do know the answer because SACL is awesome. They do something new in the area of collections. They do collections, early out billing, and purchase charged off receivables. And they treat your clients with respect unlike some of those other collections companies. So if you want to keep your clients and collect your money too, you should check out Sakel CAI. They have a banner on freetalklive.com, and it's the top banner. And 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 by the way, the principal over there, Jason Osborne, really thinks that Stephanie's a, a great co-host. So there you go. Thank you, Jason. I think you're a great everything <laughs> economist <laughs> person. <laughs> he is a professor-type economist fella. Very smart guy. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Let's go to John in Illinois. John? Hey, Mark and Stephanie, how's it going? Hi, All's John. well. What can I do it for you? I just wanted to bring up uh, a couple of days ago, I was on a podcast and I listened to it today, and you're covering um, child um, correction. Uh, you know, if the child runs the road, what do you do, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, just to give you some background, I am a parent, so I don't think you can dismiss me on uh, not having any children. Okay, I'm good. A year old and a 23 year old. Thank goodness. Um, just wanted to ask do you I'm, I'm sure you do and I'm, but I'll just do you believe in the non-aggression axiom do I believe in the non-aggression yeah sure 
That that, that is okay. uh, that I do not believe that one should use uh, force uh, to, to initiate force to achieve political or social goals. Okay. And when you uh, discipline a child, that you know, in the case of where they're uh, they're in physical danger and you and you want to get their attention immediately, is the purpose of that to keep them from doing the act, or is it to uh, somehow condition them to if they do something that you don't like that? that you're going to give them some physical correction. I think it's conditioning, and here's why. I don't think that it does any good to grab a child who has uh, run out, uh, run, you know, run halfway out of the road, uh, you know, beat their butt, because they didn't get run over by the car. You managed to stop them, whatever the scenario was. Things turned out okay. Beating their butt doesn't do anything about what occurred. I think what it, it the intention is of parents, and by the way, I have never spanked my son, uh, Jack, Yay. but I, I do understand why... Uh, um, you know, I, I kind of understand why some parents might choose to do this, and the the reason would be that look, you can't run away when mommy and daddy say don't run, stop. You know, in a parking lot, it might be one thing or another in different locations. Certain behavior is acceptable in some areas where it is not acceptable in others, and some 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 behavior is in fact dangerous. Yeah, and I would agree, but at the same time, when anytime you're you're correcting a child, you need to ask yourself, am I doing this because I'm frustrated or I'm angry at the action? Yeah, sure. Or am I am I doing this to try to correct the behavior? Am I being rational and sensible? I think that's, and, a, yeah, that, that's absolutely what parents should be addressing themselves. And I'm wondering, oh, this is, you know, this is a question I've had for years is I'm wondering, is there a rational reason to be able to spank? And I don't know that one can use, uh, philosophically use the non-aggression principle in this area because I think... That to some extent, functionally, I am the slave owner of my child. Now, um, <laughs> you know, I don't. Now, obviously, you can never truly own someone in that you can't, you know, make them speak. I can't move my vocal cords and make my son speak. He owns himself in that way. And a parent's goals, generally, the parents that I've met, um, generally, their goals are to raise a functional, intelligent uh, child that uh, you know loves them and will uh, right. care about them as uh, as life goes on. Well, I don't think that sounds like a master-slave relationship. No, but I'm just saying that, that functionally there are some... I, I have to use aggressive force on my child every single day. And by that I mean if, if he doesn't want to get his diaper changed, and often he doesn't, I have to do that for his well-being. He can't run around with feces in his, you know, next to his skin because it makes it sensitive and raw and red and it can harm him. Right. But he doesn't know any different, so I actually do use force. Well, I think We're just a, talking what kind of force. I've changed diapers too, Mark, and yeah. I, you know, I may not have children of my own, but I do I have changed many diapers in my life. And uh some you know, of it has been under force? Well, I think that there's a difference between there's a big difference between restraining a child so maybe they don't fall off a changing table or yeah. something or, you know, catching up with them so that you can you're able to change their diaper sure. and hitting them. There's okay. a huge difference. Yeah, and I, I would I would say that absolutely. the former is, you know, restraining them or maybe removing them from a dangerous situation, which is what you're doing when you change as, the as diaper. As long as we understand that it's uh, different. The, the, uh, all I, you know, John started this out with the non-aggression principle, and I really like to approach it from this angle. Mm -hmm. And as long as we're clear that everybody here is using force, then we're clear. Now, the question oh, I, is I don't know. what I don't kind think... of force and what kind of force is appropriate. I and... don't I don't think that restraining a child or removing him from a situation is force. I don't think Look, it's the restraining same. Restraining me means you own me, Stephanie. If you decide, Mark, you're not leaving this room. I mean, when, when those guys in prison, the prison guards, didn't let me out, they did it because they believed they owned me. Well, that's true. That's true. Um, so I it's just force. Think, do you think it's a different degree, though? If you're it's absolutely about degrees. Restricting someone's freedom of movement it's versus... It's about degrees. Yes, Jack's freedom of movement is restricted. Mm -hmm. When I say he can't go th go out that door, he can't go out that door, and I'm going to physically prevent him from going out. Now, the question is, what does he think when I paddle him on the bottom? And I haven't. Uh, but what would he think? For one, he would think it was a very serious thing that we had just uh, gone across, uh, just dealt with, because it's never happened before. Where did this come from? But, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, I, I guess that's what often parents will say, this is effective. Well, don't you think, Mark, that um, if you are a parent and you're responsible for Jack's safety, right? Um, I don't like the term. I don't know owning. that I am responsible for Jack's safety. The question is, you don't believe I own Jack, right? No. no then, how, then how am I responsible for him? 
Well, you, you're responsible in that you have a fiduciary responsibility to him since you've agreed to, to raise him up. How did I agree to it? You had sex with your wife. Wait a second. When? Did, oh, so so you're your saying you're part. saying that abortion uh, is 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 not a woman's choice. I I mean you've got a lot <laughs> no, no, of issues no, no. you guys sure. are throwing around here. Look, if I don't own Jack, I've got no responsibility for him. I should leave, be able to leave the door open and let him right. go wherever he wants. And the door the door is open, and if you didn't agree to raise him, then you have been gone already. But, uh, and you're you're the fact. That but you're I can't change my mind today, Jack. John. If I can't change my mind today, then Jack owns me. <laughs> Well, you, you can change it. You're, you're daily agreeing to raise him. Indeed, yeah. I do. I, I want to. I'm yeah. excited to. I, I don't think anyone's disputing that, but you know, I mean, it, let me let's bring this back I, on track, Mark. I, well, I want to ask you something. The track is: Do I, uh, you know, do I have a master servant relationship with my child to some extent? As time no. goes by, no, no, no. Responsibility. What is a yeah. fiduciary responsibility? I mean, that means you're it's, considering his his, his uh, best interest when you take actions for him. I do. And you act in his his uh, re- as a responsible adult to try to keep him on the right path. You don't do that in a way like uh, you're angry at him or you want to hurt him. You're doing that for his best interest. But right. I, I, you have a but one could spank him. and do that, right? Mm, I'm, I'm no. What? <laughs> that's not that's your that's your opinion. Go, but one go, could ask John. one could one could spank a child's bottom and still be fitting into this definition you're talking about. Uh, you know, of trying to raise a child in their best interest and all that, right? Well, ask yourself, what benefit does that serve the child that you struck him on the on the behind? I guess that that what, what you know, and I have to I have to look at this from the, the situation of not having done it. But I would say that what that what people would say is it's effective. The child remembers this activity, and I remember some of the spankings I got so, from so thirty years ago. You get you get his attention by that. Is that what you're saying? No, I think it's to uh, drive home a particularly important lesson. And I would say that for me, the only appropriate time to use that lesson that I can come up with is sort of a life or death situation where you're where you're substituting a small amount of pain for something that might very well be a great deal of pain or injury or death. Okay, so if you're you're talking about substitution, why not come up with a substitute behavior that lets Jack know that. You're serious. Like, you slam a book on the table. Every time he sees a book being slammed on the table, he knows this is serious. But isn't that, doesn't that, I mean, you know, I mean, it is, it's, it's scaring it's, him. Right. It's scaring the child any better than spanking them. I mean, isn't this no, the same thing? I think no, they're both. Your point is harmful. to try to get his attention and let him know, hey, I just, I just clap my hands together. That means. This is serious. Okay, I maybe have a question. I, maybe I could that get I a think big will... tub of water and just dump it over his head. He'd probably remember that too. You gonna waterboard? Would that be freaking weird? <laughs> okay, Mark, I have I have something I w- I would like to um, a point I would like to raise. I think that um, you know even if you consider something like restricting someone's freedom of movement, restraining a child, you know maybe so they don't run out into the street. If you consider that force, would I you? Yeah, s- you could consider it anything else. Right. Sure, but I mean, force, wouldn't you think that? Is- wouldn't you well, think that if you're raising a child, if you're interacting with a child, and if you if you have to use something that you consider force, wouldn't you want to use the least amount of force yes. that you could? Uh, I want to do what's most effective for the child. In 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 the sense, in the long run, the thing that's better for best for them. I don't want to cause them any kind of mental pain. And this is why I generally err on the side of discretion. Yeah, John, do you have more? Uh, I'm not sure that we've covered it all, but thanks. Do you have more? <laughs> um, I, I have a 17 year old and a 23 year old, you know, and I've tried these techniques and I've gone all different ways about it. Free Talk Live, live Sunday show. It's Mark and Stephanie. Give us a call at 855-450-3733. We, we've been talking about uh, here the last segment or so is uh, corporal punishment and the relationships between children and parents. Uh, this is, well, this is the show that you can call in and talk about what you want to talk about. Doug at, uh, in Minnesota appears as though he wants to talk about spanking too. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yep. Hey. Hey, nice to talk to you again. It's good to talk um, to you, Doug. Oh, is this the Doug, the Smoothie Doug? <laughs> yeah, Smoothie by Doug. Yeah. Oh, Doug is Smoothie. That's right, it was, yeah. Cool. 
That's right. Um, hey, Mark, you said something just recently on the break, before the break, that made me start thinking about my past. And my parents were spankers. Your parents were spankers, okay. Sorry to hear that, they, Doug. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I am too, actually, because I am now a non spanking convert. Um, how many, how many times did they spank is what I want to know, Doug, because this is a huge gamut. Um, you know, it's many times people who don't spank choose to put people into categories of spankers or non-spankers. But I think that it's more important uh, also to talk about how many times uh, you were spanked. That's another thing I was thinking about. And, and caveat, I don't have kids here. But okay. I, but um, everybody was a child at one point, Doug, and that counts. I yeah. think your I think your thoughts matter. I uh, also think that there's a practical application that goes into being being a parent. But I'm interested in what you have to say. Yeah, I um I was spanked. I think we were spanked rarely. I, okay. I just don't know for sure. I would say something like maybe a couple times a year. Okay. It had to have been something pretty serious. Um, I think, but maybe. It was more often. I'll have to ask my mom. But I remember... She doesn't remember either. I don't know. I'll have to ask her. I'll bet she doesn't. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Here's something that you said, though. You said um, one of the things in the last call I brought up, Mark, you thought that people spanked to make a point, you know, to train the kid that what you did was dangerous, wrong. I want to get your attention about this. Not just wrong, but dangerous is it, it, dangerous. you know if right. if you want my ad uh, you want me to advocate anything um right. and and I'm not saying I do, I'm just thinking about this is if I were to advocate anything, I would advocate it to use as training to prevent situations that uh you know may occur that are deadly. But at the same time, right. Mark, you haven't used it so I far. haven't needed to. At this point, I have never needed to employ that tool. I hope never to need to employ that tool. It is not going to be something that I pull out immediately. I can assure you of that. Right. And here's the thing that got me thinking. I began to think about this. Of all the times I was spanked, and it must have been many over my lifetime, I can't remember why or any of them. Mm -hmm. Sure. Doug, I completely believe that because... When kids are scared, that's all they can focus on is the fear. And what they learn is to be fearful. They don't learn a lesson or not to do something or to do something. They just learn to fear the person that's hitting them. And so that's one reason it's not effective. Another is that every research that has been done on this has shown, one, kids who are hit have more likelihood of becoming violent themselves with other kids. That research is only on children that are spanked uh, often. Um, is, is the, the, uh, that, that same... I don't know about that. I mean, I think it's that, spanking I, is extremely common. 70 to 90 percent of parents that, that across all socioeconomic But far groups. fewer do it regularly and often. And this is where the, the violent, the, the study that I saw was children that were spanked, I think it was four to five times a week. So you're talking oh. about somebody who's really wailing on that kid. And Doug, the point I'd like well, to make is studies. spanking's really only intended to be effective for a short period of time. By the time you were 12, you could probably figure out how to cross the street. Whereas, you know, your parent may have been trying to teach you at three, you don't run away from me in the parking lot because it's deadly. Right. And the point that I would like to make about that is that how are they ever supposed to learn how to reason if nobody tries and nobody is patient with them and teaches them? If well, how are they supposed well, to reason if their head is turned into a watermelon, a, a smushed melon? Well, well on how the, are they the supposed to reason, reason if their brain is turned to a, a, a stop I don't sign think by one or two fear spankings? I don't know that. I'd like to see the study, like the, the you know, I'd like to see the study that says one spanking turns uh, children into Jeffrey Dahmer, and I don't think it's out there. Well, no, it is not, but. When a kid is hit, when they're being faced with physical violence, they feel fear. They get a fight or yep. flight response. And kids who are spanked often and hit often, and of course it's a continuum from seldom to often, you know, they're, that inhibits brain development because they constantly feel scared. And they, they and don't develop those critical thinking skills. I want to tell you my experience, and it's strange, and Mark, you brought up something. You said, I bet by the time you were 12, you learned how to cross the street. My last spanking, I had already gone through puberty. And my dad spanked me, and it was embarrassing and shameful, and I was nervous and, and like, twittery, and, I, you know, uh, and he, he insisted on the spanking. I must have done something pretty bad. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what it was. But oh, I was a young man, and so I think Steffi might be right. The, the thing was this shame, this, this embarrassment of having my bare butt spanked by my dad when I had pubic hair. 
Yeah, I've got, yeah. I've got to say that it doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense to me, and I, that that does seem to me sort of domination uh, activity, where hey, this is my house, I make the rules around here, well, and if it's you're always, not going to follow the rules, it's always domination. I'm no matter what age the kid is. It is domination in the sense that I don't I, I'm I demand my child's obedience when it comes to deadly situations because I know that he doesn't have the cognitive abilities today and now um, to be able to handle these things. I talk to him on a regular basis. We just talked today about why daddy was gonna let him watch the show that he wanted to watch rather than watching the show that I was watching, because normally I wouldn't do that. But I felt that the, in the circumstances that that made sense to let him watch blues clues and you know, about some guy who uh, spends most all of his time at his house talking to his dog and his imaginary talking plates and stuff um and, and, you know as opposed to what i was watching at the time because i just felt like it was a better t- so I, I attempt to do these things but there are times i feel that one needs to communicate quickly hopefully i don't run across these uh, situations or i come up with other ways to do it because i think there are better punishments well mark but no, one it, of these things that i've heard is that no extrinsic um motivations that you should should not use extrinsic motivations at all. And if you take away uh, timeouts and spankings, and what is a parent left with as a tool? Well, lots of things. And the most important thing is connecting with a child and trying to understand what they're feeling and what they need. Because kids do need things, and they have emotional and psychological needs that aren't just things like food and water. And, you know, getting understanding those and understanding the needs that are present in yourself as a parent are are key to connect, making that connection with your child. Doug, and, were you, know, were Mark, you uh, used? Were timeouts used on you? I don't think they were. Um, I don't remember my parents doing timeouts. Were um, stickers think, and uh, you know other so, little prizes used to, for motivations for you? Yes. Do you remember what they were used very, for? They were pretty darn good. They were good parents. You know, they spank once in a while. Um, I. The, the the benefits things you mean the the the, the carrot not the stick the ca- um, the carrot versus the stick yeah well I remember one of it was schoolwork and you know money for grades which yeah I remember that yeah yeah it's really at but you don't remember what you learned earned the grade for this is the point that I'm making is people well, often don't remember crap true. from their childhood yeah. <laughs> well one of the reasons for that is that you know I. <laughs> I, yes, people sometimes don't remember things from their childhood, but Doug did remember being hit. He remembered being hit, but he didn't remember, remember why too. he was hit. Uh, and, and, and he doesn't remember why he got the stickers necessarily either. Yeah. Hey, one more thing before I go here. Um, I want to bring this up because this is pretty fascinating and I think a good thing. Stern, conservative psychology talk show host, Dr. Laura, she said, do not spank your kids. Instead, do this. When they're about to do something bad, they're going to hurt themselves. You want to get a point across. You grab them by the arm, not to hurt them, and you pull them close to your face, and you get in their face, and you are very angry and, and, and sternly, not yelling, not, you know, but just say, do not do that, and, and explain why. But that alone will startle a kid, and they're... That will, you know, almost it's almost like spanking in a way, you know. Doug yeah, Doug, that is ex- that is almost like spanking because you're scaring the hell out of the kid, and I don't know that that's much better, honestly. Well, I think. I, I, now that I say that, you, I think you might be right, something. Doug, but, uh, Doug, I just down. want to say before you go, Doug, I'm really sorry that that happened to you. The all the spankings and you know the thing with your dad, and I'm glad that you're thinking about it now and you've made a conscious decision not to be uh, a hitter. Free talk yep. live. Give us a call at 855-450-FREE. That's the SACL toll-free call-in line. Let me tell you about the Free State Project real quick. Stephanie and I are both movers for the Free State Project. It is a movement to get 20,000 liberty-loving individuals, you know, 
we're not going to stop at 20,000. <laughs> it's okay. Once it's we a, get to that point, people will want to move here way beyond 20,000. It's a movement to concentrate people who believe in the ideas of liberty, the idea that government should, at its very maximum, protect life, liberty, and property all to one state so that we can work on making that happen by concentration of our voices amongst the community, uh, through uh, political action in some cases, through civil action in other cases, through media, these kind of things. You can be involved. Go to freestateproject.org. It's freestateproject.org. Um, we have been talking about discipline, I guess, amongst uh, parents and children. Let's go to, I got to try this name here, Uk- Uka Arlene? Ukara. Ukara? Okay. Hi, Ukara. There's a Ukara lean here. Is there any chance it's Ukara lean? <laughs> no. Okay. It's Ukara. Calling from Michigan. That part I can get. <laughs> Close enough. It's not Michigan? Missouri? No. Yes. Okay. I think the abbreviation for Missouri is MO, and perhaps the board op uh, put down the wrong abbreviation. So, <laughs> what you want to talk about, Kara? I'd like to continue child discipline. Okay. And uh, I just, I really have to say, I do not agree with uh, some of the things that people have been saying. Okay. What, what um, Make your point. Okay. Well, first of all, um, as a child, I was thanked, and I am not sorry for it. I am very glad, and it was something that my mother, she did discipline me. Now, I did also have a father who was abusive, but they were very, there were two very different things that I can distinguish between me. And I do have to say, as a mother, I do discipline my children. And by discipline, and you mean I, spank? Yes, At times? Sir. Yeah. I kind of wish people would just call it what it is, well, which is hitting. I think that, you yeah. know, there's there's motor vehicles. Some of those motor vehicles are trucks. Some of those motor vehicles are cars. Some of those motor vehicles are motorcycles. So spanking specific, specifies what activity we're talking about. Um, well, yeah. people... Ukara, what, what you mean when you say spanking is you mean that you paddle a child on the butt, either with your hand or an object, right? Okay. You know, it's when people use these euphemisms, people have called in on the subject numerous times and they've said, oh, a little pat on the butt or a little smack well, on the fanny. It, depending depending on the size of the child, you really a pat really might not be too far from the truth. I mean, I can deliver one heck of a blow, but I wouldn't deliver that blow on my three year old um, to the to the level that I could. So I right. Mean, but the point of a spank is to scare them right and to show and to ostensibly teach them a lesson. Right. And so it has to be forceful. Not forceful enough to hurt them and scare them. It's not about scaring them. No, ma'am, you have it all wrong. Oh, I have it all wrong. If you are doing it for that reason, then you are not doing it for the correct reason. What's the correct reason? Okay, well, now, I'm not speaking for all Christians here, so I don't want people to, if they're against it, look at Christianity as a stereotype and look against them in the wrong light. Okay. Let me guess, you're going to spank your children to make them godly. This is what we heard last week. To make them godly? Yes, this is what somebody said I last week. I them to cleanse their conscience. Cleanse, the cleanse their conscience? Let, 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 her, let, let, let her talk. I'm, I'm interested in this. I've never heard of the cleanse, conscience cleansing spanking, so please. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, I do not believe a child should be spanked for something that they don't know what they're doing. There's a difference between training and there's a difference between spanking. If a child knows that they are doing wrong and they willfully do it anyway... That is when the disciplinary action of spanking comes into action. And how do you know if they know that they're doing it wrong or doing something wrong? Do you have children? I don't have children. I can tell you I've seen Jack uh, look me right in the eye and do what it is that he's not supposed to do. Well, I, you know, I, I, Is he testing? Is he seeing whether I'm going to be consistent? I don't know what he does and why he does it. And I, I, willful, I see, it seems to me he's testing the boundaries. Thank you. That's that's my exact point. When they know, and when you know that they know, if you're guessing that they know, that's probably not the best time to do it. You know, uh... now, the whole point of it when your child knows that they're doing wrong, and I remember as a child. I mean, I actually have memories from the age of three. You, when you do something wrong, you do feel bad about it. So why does a parent you need to? Wrong. 
Why does a parent supposedly need to hit a child if the child does feel bad when they do something wrong? Yukara. Are you supposed to pat them on the back and say, oh, it's okay, I know you did wrong, but there's, there, there's nothing bad about that? Or are you supposed to take action? I mean, when a child is wrong, sitting them in the corner, does that not do the same thing? Or are you saying that that's the only kind that we're allowed to do? Well, sometimes when I, I'm not saying you're allowed or not allowed to do anything, you're a sovereign individual. But, you know, sometimes when a child does something that hurts themselves, then they, they have a consequence, right? When they stick their finger in a socket, they might get zapped, you know, and so they experience a consequence. And sometimes oh, when they do something that hurts that someone else, they it. feel what bad. Something, what if it's just something that they're not supposed to do? They feel that guilt. They feel that shame. Then it may be an arbitrary thing. And, you know, I think guilt and shame, guilt and shame are, are, not at all. uh, You didn't even hear what I was saying, (laughs) but go on, make your point. And then I want, I would like to ask you a question. All right. Myself as a Christian, when I have a guilty conscience, quite frankly, I have had God, and this is spiritually speaking, not any literal physical sense, but I have God. I've had God flat out turn me over his knee and thank me. I mean, honestly. Do you believe in self-flagellation? I believe in what? Flagellation. Self-flagellation. That's the only type of flagellation you can do, right? I Maybe think you can, f- you can hit, whip okay. someone else. It's do you, whipping. Do you believe in, in, in uh, self-flagellation, which is uh, beating yourself in order to uh, you know, atone for sins? Do you believe in sending someone to jail when they do something wrong? I... In, unless there's a victim, no. It, right. I mean, if they're a danger to... Uh, to if they've hurt to someone society, else, then... I, I do. Okay, when someone does something wrong, they are supposed to get in trouble for that, right? You know, you... This isn't the question I was asking you, Cara. Actually, but I, I think you misunderstood my question. Do you believe in... Uh, it, it, this is a Christian concept, at least a por- partially Christian. Sex of Christians do this, which is beat themselves for sin. So when they do you something know, wrong... That... I don't agree with that, no. Okay. okay. I was just wondering. I mean, you know, it, it sounded like you might be going down that road, and I was interested. Uh, this is a, it's an unusual aspect. Uh, monks in the, the Dark Ages used to wear hair shirts because I the world is supposed asked. to be so, suffering. So, Yukara, I have a question I would like okay. to ask you. Um, are you aware that all the research that's been done on spanking has shown that children who are hit are more likely to be violent with other children and have uh, problems with brain development? They have lower IQ, they have trouble with critical thinking uh, because of all this fear and constant activation of the fight or flight response. If you yeah, if you knew that those things were true, would you still advocate spanking? I believe you're spe- speaking of abuse. I don't believe you're actually talking about spanking because when a parent does something in anger, that will come across to the child as anger and that will cause mental damage and that will cause problems. I don't see you, you, how you could you be Cara, violent thank- with a kid in, in love or... <laughs> thank you for the call. Free Talk Live. Fifty-five four fifty free. That's the SACL toll-free call in line, 855-450-3733. How big is the debt crisis, really? Prepare to be dumbfounded. Go to learnliberty.org slash FTL and see Anthony Davies' explanation of the magnitude of the U.S. debt. As the camera pans out over this minute-long video and the, the bar graphs continue to rise... You will be stunned by the U.S. debt in comparison to other numbers and what's causing the U.S. debt. It's a little over a minute long, but you'll be amazed. And share this video with your friends. Email it to people. Put it on Facebook. Share it on your Facebook so other folks can see it. When you're there, check out the Liberty Academy link on the right-hand side. It's a course for people who want free, online, continuing education, economics, philosophy, liberty, and rights. LearnLiberty.org slash FTL. And did you know that you can help out Free Talk Live for just $3 a month? Amp.freetalklive.com is the place to go if you would like to find out more about that opportunity and get perks. Perks. Everybody wants some <laughs> secret per- perks. Perquisites. I would like to say something about the last call. Uh, Yukara, I believe was okay. her name. It's, it really uh, saddens me when people desperately try to defend their parents who have hurt them. And, you know, nobody wants to admit 
that they were hurt. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to admit that something bad happened, but there's a part of yourself or the person, you know, every person who was hurt by their parents that needs empathy and needs to speak up and, and be recognized. And I think uh, this this whole concept of spanking uh, and punishing kids is extremely relevant to liberty. And here's why. Or I can tell you after this call if you want, Mark. I know you're anxious to get to them. Well, yeah, well, fine. That's fine. Fine. We'll take uh, David in New Hampshire. David? Good evening. Howdy. I was going to ask Stephanie something. Sure. Um, how do you explain the many people that don't think um, banking is quite as bad as you think it is. And many of the people, like you mentioned, somebody mentioned the 70% number. 70 to 90% of parents hit their kids. That's the number that I've seen most recently. Right. Um, um, and if, 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 if they spank, um, how do you explain like kids that grown up and said, and, and, and are saying are somewhat, to an extent, uh, um, saying it was it wasn't that bad. Well, I think that a lot of people are in denial, and like I just said, nobody wants to admit that they had something bad happen to them, and it's really difficult to face up to that um, that aspect and maybe acknowledge that hey, this wasn't the best thing. Somebody might have made a mistake here. A lot of people don't don't want to say that, but it's really important because only by connecting with that aspect of of yourself, your child self. Uh, is can you can you really reconcile those things that happened and become a healthier person? Well, I'd I'd say that for myself, maybe I wasn't such a good kid sometimes. I mean, really not a good kid, and that might have been the reason why it happened. To me. Oh, okay, like well, I, David, I'm when you say... say like a lot of people, I'm gonna like a lot of people. There's like a world of difference between getting an occasional spanking when you're really, really, really bad, and and then and like like people have said, you know, getting hit all the time, regular abuse. Yeah, yeah, of course, David. Of course, there's a continuum there, but it doesn't make the the lower end of the continuum good or acceptable or right. I mean, I think that violence against children is wrong, and we should apply moral principles universally. And if we wouldn't say it's right or okay to hit another adult or an old person, even if they don't have the same cognitive skills as us, if we if they don't do what we say, then it's not okay to hit a child if we don't do if they don't do what we say. And you know, you said you mentioned that you were bad as a kid, David. I don't know what well, happened or, yeah. or what you did, but you know, so often when people say that kids are bad, they're often just not being obedient to to their parents, and sometimes maybe they are doing something that that hurts someone else or something like that. But, you know, often kids repeat what they see in their environment. And so I think it's incumbent upon parents to look within themselves and see if maybe that's occurring. Also, there's Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, they're, yes. I mean I'm mean, i not saying that that's what occurs with spanking. I don't know. I don't feel that um, – I, I feel that maybe some judgment could have been used differently mm-hmm. um, in some of the spanking incidences uh, as a child. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel unloved. I don't feel like my parents have done something horrifying or anything like that. Well, no, and they but can still Stockholm love Stockholm Syndrome does exist, and people do have affinity for people who do terrible things to them. Yes. David, we have – a bunch of calls i appreciate yours okay. let's go to let's go to to ed in tennessee ed how you gentlemen and lady done uh, Hello. just fine hey uh yeah I, i'll definitely back you up stephanie on this because i got a little a little saying i made up use your brain not your hand i, I mean, like that why do we want all this uh control mm. because when my I, I reared my son and uh as he got older, you know, as the teenage years, they want to smart off and all. When they'd smart off to me, I'd say, man, I wish y'all didn't have your own brain and mouth. But <laughs> but you do, and uh, I'm certainly going to let you use it. So, you know, I'm I'm really libertarian in that sense. But mm-hmm. And spanking does lead to, like, a lot of sexual problems, like you were talking about, Stephanie, and about more aggression. And, and I think we'll look at it as uh, secondhand smoke now. But uh, And like I want to ask parents out there why do you want to hit a child think about that what are you Mm -hmm. doing Mm -hmm. you're hitting another person yes and and you know they and they're a lot smarter than what you think and stephanie uh you may know more of the facts on that but 
You remember the story about the mother that let her eight, nine, or ten year old child make it home, make it. Uh, he made it. Oh, home. he rode the bus by himself, I and think she it was, was the, the subway bus too, and everything. Yeah. and everybody freaked out on that. She but was hey, called Mark, the worst it, mother in America. <laughs> right? Hey, they did a special on that uh, of mothers all around the world, free range and kids. You wouldn't believe, what... like in Africa and all, they get to get around the fires. They don't just helicopter them, you know, nonstop, <laughs> and they make it. Yeah. But hey, Mark, this is something I'd like to tell you and uh, Stephanie both. I read a real good article, and listen to this. Uh, if you think genes don't affect how people behave, consider this fact. If you are a carrier of a particular set of genes, the probability that you will commit a violent crime is four times as high yep. as it would be if you lacked those genes. Mm-hmm. Look, you're but it's three rare. times likely to commit ro- robbery. But it's rare. Five times likely to commit aggravated assault. Ninety-eight percent of those on death row have these genes. Wow. That's, and, that's and you remember Mark, you I remember wouldn't think ninety eight percent of the people on death row were guilty, frankly. <laughs> right, but that doesn't mean everybody who has those genes is going to be on death row. It's or that they did the crime that, that they were doing. No, no. Mm-hmm. What what it's saying is you don't have so much free will as you think. Sure. Because yeah. do you remember the the Charles Whitman uh, story, the guy in Texas that climbed the tower that killed all those people years back? No. Guess I'm not what familiar. he wrote? What? Well, anyway, he climbed the tower. He knew he was changing. He even wrote stuff saying. What is going on with me? And guess what they found out? He left a note saying, do an autopsy on my brain. And guess what they discovered? He had a brain he tumor. He had a tumor yeah. pushing on a certain area in the brain, mm. and it made him do what he did. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. And that's been proven now. So you see what I'm saying? Yeah. We don't have as much free will. So quit hitting these kids. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Especially children. Thank you. Thank you very all right, much. Enjoy Ed. your show. Ed, thanks. Yeah. You Let's, know, it's true that, that things like genes, I mean, we can't be totally deterministic. Of course, people have a choice, you know, especially when they're given a choice, right? And and given a choice to act in a moral manner, right? Um, you know, people do have a choice, but genes have a huge influence on how people behave. And if, and things like brain tumors can severely affect people's uh personality and so what does a parent behavior. do if they've got one of these bad kids i mean if that's that's the claim here right that these well, genes make one bad well if their kid has a brain tumor then the they take the child to a doctor <laughs> well i don't know that you're going to know that your child has a tumor uh they, they didn't they didn't know with this fella i mean well sure but if i don't think ed was saying that those genes make people bad i think he was saying especially if someone has these genes they may be predisposed especially if they have a bad home environment to commit crimes later on in life. Indeed. So it does. the genes don't make them bad. Free Talk Live, 855-450-FREE. Free Talk Live... It's the show about your calls, but we've got so many of them, I'm not giving out the number. <laughs> Stephanie, <laughs> tell me about the uh, shop.freetalklive.com. Yep. It's, if you go to that place, shop.freetalklive.com, you can enter Amazon through Free Talk Live's portal and help support Free Talk Live effortlessly. They will get a, a little spiff of whatever you buy, and the price is the same for you. If you smoke cigarettes, you know at some point they're going to kill you. You've probably thought about trying the e-cigarette. It's a healthier option, 22,000 times healthier. And here's a great offer from Vaporsmiths.com. Vaporsmiths makes one of the best vaporizers on the market. It allows you to get a full hit as opposed to some of these weaker ones that, uh, you know, just kind of half hits and it's no fun at all. <laughs> you don't want one. Um, you already start saving money because e-cigarettes are significantly cheaper than those taxed cigarettes. No kidding. <laughs> yep. And you can get a free starter kit from Vaporsmiths.com and free shipping with the purchase of 40 quarter cartomizers that's what they call the little things that hold the nicotine, and coupon code FTL. Use coupon code FTL, buy 40 cartomizers, get a free starter kit, and free shipping on orders of $60 or more. You can call 855-2-GET-VAPOR, go to Vaporsmiths.com, 855-2-GET-VAPOR, or Vaporsmiths.com. Let's go to Jim in Idaho. Jim? Jim, can you hear me? Uh, if you're talking to Jim in Indiana, yes, I can. Okay. Sorry. I <laughs> Both start with I. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I, I will talk about my early life. Okay. I was born an obstinate child. 
My mother encouraged it. So did she do she did the same with my sister. She encouraged obstinance? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we never got spanked by my mother. Okay. My mother died when I was five. Sorry to hear oh, that. Oh, sorry. Uh, my grandmother had to start raising me. My grandmother was running a business. She put me right in school, first grade, a four-room schoolhouse in Appalachia. So um, I assume that they had corporal punishment in the school? They did, but they never corporal punished me. Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, I uh, did not do anything uh, terrible, except that I did not want to be there, and I refused to speak to the teacher for the whole year. <laughs> wow, and I think that's both interesting. My, both my grandmothers and one uncle were at the school trying to get things straight, mm-hmm. and I would not acknowledge the necessity of me speaking to that teacher. Well, it sounds like your mother, um, you know, encouraged critical thinking, you know, and not just following <laughs> orders blindly or submitting to arbitrary authority. So you that could, sounds you, pretty you cool. Could, you could stretch it out that way. And every every child is an individual and needs to be handled as an individual. That much is, that's the God's agree. honest truth. Uh, Jim from Indiana, thank you for the thank call. You, you know, children, every child does need to be raised differently. Let's go people, to... People are individuals and children are people. <laughs> I think we had two Jims in Indiana. What, what are the chances uh, of that? We should get some kind of prize. Jim? <laughs> yes, you're talking to the other Jim from Indiana. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, now I'm going to say the other thing. I'm going to support spanking, and I'm going to do it with some facts because you guys are really missing the boat on it. Uh, Mr. Hyman, who started this whole uh, argument against spankings and was on Montel Williams and did a lot of things. Wait, wait, wait. Who's Mr. Hyman? I don't know. I've, I've never heard of a yeah. Hyman, and I don't support spanking. I know what a Hyman is. Well, no, I, it's he, a body he part. Opposes, he opposes he opposes spanking and on an on on a right but i level, i i suppose i oppose spanking too and i've all. never heard this guy so right. well, there's and, a philosophical fine, reason but, to not but spank making, but you're also making claims that every research you've told uh one of the callers and this is what inspired do a me search to call you, do a go- google search I, I did you told the caller that all the research says that all the spanking is bad but you're not doing your research out of Berkeley, California, one of the biggest uh, supporters out of Berkeley uh, University, who was uh, a Bauman, who a big supporter, anti-spanking supporter, she did a research, a research study, one of the largest studies done, and actually found the, re- the, re- the results were in opposition to what she anticipated. She thought they would support, because the only biggest thing she did is she separated the abusive um, treatment that kids were receiving from spanking. Under Jim, strict guidelines Jim, of it's all was. abuse. Jim, it's abuse. Some of it's worse than no, others. I, I disagree uh, with this entirely. Uh, um, uh, Stephanie, the two people have called that have said that they've both been abused and spanked, and they said they know the difference. And I don't, I, I don't think that it's it's fair to call think it the same a, thing. You don't think it's abusive to hit someone? I, I'd really like to hear what uh, Jim has to say as far as this, as far as this research goes. What's tell me about the research, the research Jim? Because we really we're on a time schedule here. I understand that. The research, and that's why I'm trying to talk quickly, because there's tons of information, and unfortunately, they can't get out quickly enough. The simple fact is this. If you spank, there are guidelines, and if you, if you were to have guidelines with spanking, you do not use a closed hand, for example. You only use an open hand. You use a spank, if you spank the child. I don't need, no, spans, I don't don't need, need spanking need, instructions. We don't need you're instructions. Gonna, you're going to give me a study. I don't want instructions on how to, how to spank know, your kid. Jim, so Jim, Jim. Guidelines. If Jim. you use these guidelines, and Jim. under, these, under Bauman's research, when people use guidelines like this, are you still there? Yep. Okay, when people use guidelines like this and did not do stuff that actually was abusive, abusive being um, hitting a child, you hurt, that's abusive. If you hit a child once and it hurt you, you can guarantee you just abuse that child. Okay, no so Tim, the there's a what's fine the, line what is it, bombing, you said? between whatever you're describing yeah. And you know what? There's a moral argument as well as a research argument. And, you know, you, you're talking about the one study that I... The moral argu- argument goes along with opera condition, simple, basic uh, research, simple, basic, analytic behavior. Right, and there's a and lot of research that shows and, operant and, and, conditioning and, and, is harmful to children as well. And if you'd, if you'd allow me to let, you know, get, get this out here, hitting is force, spanking is hitting. And I don't think that anyone would agree that it's okay to hit another adult or to hit an older person or to even hit a newborn baby. You Jim, know? I got to let you go. You what is the name of this? Tell me about the study. Baby, Jim, be, what's the, the name of the study? Was done by, the study was done. I don't have. Just tell me. So tell me. Give me a fact. Supportive. One fact. Bauman? Bauman. If you look up 
Bob, B-A-U-M, uh, something like that. It starts like that. Do a Google search. If you type in Google spanking uh, Berkeley, you'll come up with them. Thank Google- you. If Let's you to, want to desperately justify your I just mistaken want to see position, the study. I think that the studies you've been quoting have been studies on a great deal of spanking uh, in a, in a short period of time, and I just don't think those are fair entirely. Let's go to Rick in Michigan. Rick, can you hear me? Hi. Yep. Hi, great to be on. I I really appreciate this. Um, quick, quick. I I believe that there's a fine line between discipline and abuse. Uh, discipline um, i mean you need to be calmed down you need to not be mad at your child you need to know what you're going to say to your child abuse is from being mad and spanking out of anger i see a lot of people have brought this point up but it it I, seems but, very um incompatible to me like to say child. that someone could someone could hit a child and not have any anger in their mind at the same time you're hitting well, someone else uh, if my child was standing on the edge of uh, something high and, and wasn't looking, was going to fall, I, I would grab her and get her attention, explain to her why she was going to be in trouble. That That is uh, being stern, a fatherly um, voice, a strong voice, stern, something that's going to snap, wake her up. And would you hit her? No, no. Okay. When she was two years old, I swatted her on the bottom. But that was to get her attention, and I gave her much love much love after that and i tell you what i haven't had to discipline her like that ever since yeah i i you know i i don't think there's ever a case where anybody has to that just removes the responsibility from the individual for their actions saying that i have to do something oh the kid made me do it no you always have a choice and there are many parents out there who have chosen to raise their kids without hitting them and we have heard from some of them tonight and you know what they're they're fine they're good for it and that's why I say that there, there should be discipline, but not in a physical way. Uh, okay. um, a lack of discipline can be just as bad as physical abuse because the child will grow up without any kind of boundaries. Or And what do you mean when you say discipline? Discipline? Time out, it's, yelling, that it's, kind of thing? It's, it's a wake-up call. It's a, it's a, a, you, get, you get their attention, and you look at them, and you explain to them, this is what you're doing that can hurt you. That either you can maybe going to hurt yourself physically or even... Um, in a way that when you get older, it it can affect your life. Well, I think we heard from, uh, we heard from Hannah earlier this week. As the adult, adult that you were, well, I feel that God left me responsible to raise my child, to teach my child how to live and and not get hurt. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, it's great that you haven't hit, and I commend you for that. I know it can be really difficult to be a parent. It's the hardest job in the world, and they often don't get enough credit. Um, you know, but there. But if if you take the time to educate yourself about discipline, you may find exactly. that it's it can be it can be uh, harmful to a child just as hitting can be. And as we heard from Hannah earlier in this week, um, connecting with a child is really uh, a better long run strategy for Rick, helping them learn. Okay. Thank you for the call, Rick. I want to talk about this real quick. Mm-hmm. When you're talking about educate yourself on discipline, the fact is discipline's like so many other topics out there. Uh, my wife has read many parenting books at this point, and mm-hmm. we are not convinced on this you know, subject in one shape or another. Mm-hmm. You can educate yourself into a corner in so many different ways. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like so many people out there that say, you don't agree with me. You need to get educated. And I I think there's a lot of different studies out there. Well, everybody has to uh, find their own way. And, Mark, I'm, I'm glad that you care about Jack enough to learn about this thing. And I think that you're doing a great job. Free Talk Live.